You're listening to a teaching from Sundown Church. We hope you encounter God through our podcast and experience freedom in your life. Good morning. I don't have Jay here to yell back good morning. So you guys are, you're up. There, Sarah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is an honor and a joy to be a father. Um, we all know this, and if there are several birthdays that fall on this day, the twins' birthday is today. If you have, you know, send them a message. But they, how? What are they? Eighteen now? Nineteen. Nineteen now. They're on the last teen. They're just big and old and grown up now. I, I, I said they're old. I didn't say you're old. I mean, but we could talk about it if you want to go there. <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I don't, I'm not that dumb. Uh, it is also, if you see Kai, he'll probably tell you. If he doesn't know you, he'll still probably tell you. It's Kai's birthday as well. He's six. He's very excited about it. And he feels that it is of the utmost importance that everyone on earth knows that today is Kai's day. So we're going to just, me and him are going to battle all day for who gets to be celebrated. Um, no, but good morning. Happy Father's Day. Um, the word that the Lord brought for today, uh, it caught me by surprise when I realized that it would take place on Father's Day. He deposits these, these words and he brings this revelation and we begin to process it. And then when I sit down to actually write it out and everything that he's been speaking throughout the week and I start to write it out, that's about when I realize what day this is gonna fall on. And that's when I realized it this week on Thursday, I realized that this was gonna fall on Father's Day. Uh, and so there is, there's a different weight to it today and there's a different understanding than I had originally thought uh, but church, we live, we live in a day, and we all know this, uh, where both men and women are completely and totally under attack. Uh, those that represent traditional roles, and, and what society is now calling traditional roles is systemic oppression. And I don't remember any systemic oppression the day Sarah and I got married. I don't remember any oppression when we had our first kid. I don't remember any oppression on our second and third, and I don't remember Sarah ever asking for a break because she feels oppressed because she's a mom, right? None of that has ever happened. And, um, but anyways, they, we, we reject, as a society right now, we reject traditional roles. Um, they, are, they are actually hated by society. We live in a day where a woman who decides to stay home and raise kids is looked down upon, um, and we're getting to the point now where a woman who just wants to have kids and be a mom is looked down upon. It's not even about just staying home. It's about not having a, or not having just a career, but having a, cause you can have a career and be a parent, but now it's like, well, why would you give up some of your dream to also be a parent? Like you should just, that's just, that's oppression is what that is. You should be able to go and do whatever you want to do in, in the world and you shouldn't have to worry about kids. And so it's just this ridiculous thing. And then men like me who have a wife that stays home and raises kids, we're looked at as like monsters because she must be at home chained to the wall. Otherwise she would have her own beautiful life away from you, but you must be oppressing her. And so this is the ridiculousness of the world today. And as I'm talking about this, you can hear the ridiculousness of it. Ridiculousness of it. Um, but women who, who want to honor men are looked down upon. Women who are not willing to just grab the mic and start bashing everything that's wrong with men uh, are looked down upon because that's a societal norm right now. Uh, and, you know, women, this is a big conversation, but women who want to only compete against biological women under attack. You're somehow that makes you racist and sexist and just a horrible human being. But this is the ridiculousness of the world right now. And we're talking about the, the, the women's struggles and the things that women are facing right now is very much on the forefront of discussion. It is talked about very widely across the board. It's debated heavily. Um, 
and it's just, it's, it's kind of everywhere right now. You can, anywhere on social media, news, any of that stuff, it's, it's there. Uh, we talk about these things a lot right now. But we are not talking about what men endure, and I think that's a problem in our society. We do not discuss the struggles of men. We do not discuss the, the difficulties that men face on a regular basis. Um, there, was, there was a famous psychologist, I can't, I'm, I'm forgetting her name, but she was a, she was a feminist and she was uh, very much one, an outspoken against men kind of person, just put them down. She was doing research for a book to talk about the superiority of, of women to men and the ridiculousness of men and all the things and how they're, oh, it's so hard for them. And so what she did is she disguised herself as a man and lived as a man, cut her hair, started to change the way she dressed, tried to ch disguise her voice, and she lived like that for a year. And this is a true story. At the end of that year, she was suicidal and had to be put in the hospital because she said she was treated for a year so horribly by women that she wanted in this mental, mental state of being a man, she wanted to end her own story. And she was just playing pretend. So there's struggles on both sides of this, but we aren't talking about what men endure largely because though, we live in a society that doesn't respect uh, the guy who works every day to provide a good life for his wife and kids. He's a bad guy in our society right now. Um, in a society where we have more kids being raised by single moms, we are, and we complain about this and we talk about how this is an issue, and it is an issue. Single mo mothers are not meant to raise sons on their own. That's not, not to the design of God. That is not it at all. They're meant to be a father, and society knows that, and it talks about that, but what it also does is it judges and hates on the fathers that stay. Isn't that ridiculous? We're mad at men for leaving and we're mad at men for staying. How dare they go and how dare they stay? How dare you abandon your kids and how dare you be there for your kids? There's no winning. This is, this is the world that we live in right now. But another reason, and this is what the Lord has been showing me this week, another reason that this is not talked about largely in society is that we as men do not voice what we're going through. We don't voice, we don't articulate. We do not share our struggles. Women are willing to talk about what they're facing. They're willing to have open and honest discussion with one another. And so, what is, so we see it in society, we see it talked about. Men, what do we do? What have we been trained to do? Suppress, suppress, suppress. Because being tough means that you are emotionally stoic all the time. And that's what being a man is in our society. The last time I checked, it was harder to face my emotions than it was to suppress them. So it's probably, it's tougher to face the struggle you're dealing with than it is to just ignore it until it explodes in your face. But that's what we, that's the practice that we as men have picked up. Men do not share. So we as men are oblivious to the struggles of our brothers. The fathers that are, that are walking right next to us, our friends, we are oblivious to what they're going through. And today, specifically, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about the golden rule. Having set that up, we know what the golden rule is. What is the golden rule? Treat others the way you want to be treated, right? But we are not going to talk. Every, everyone who has children knows that rule and has used that rule on their children. I don't, Daily. Yeah, like a million times, I think, is a, a safe estimate. But it's always about, you know, sharing your toys, speaking kindly, like it, including your siblings. Like we, we do this all the time. We have this conversation with Liam and Kai all the time. Um, but it's always about a behavior, right? It's always about a behavioral modification, right? To get them to recognize that the seeds that you sow are the seeds that you will reap. And, and it's always talking about behavior. Uh, Matthew seven twelve. so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. 
for this is the law and the prophets. Treat others the way you want to be treated. And we use this as parents. And why do we use this as parents? Because it was used on us. I, I come from a family of six. I had four siblings. I was the oldest. And I heard this every day. It was, I was almost in trouble before my head even lifted off the pillow in the morning because I was the oldest. So if somebody did something else, it was because I showed them how to do that thing, I guess. Uh, that's just how being the oldest works. You're just, you live in trouble. And so I heard this a lot. And when the golden rule is mentioned, again, it's typically used for behavioral modification. But if that's all we see, then we are missing the profound nature of why the Lord spoke this to us. We're going to look, we're going to go into Matthew 7 right now. If you can turn there, we're going to be in verse 24 because uh, we, we see the, the golden rule in verse 12 of Matthew 7. But I, wanna, I want us to see how this, this message from Jesus is concluded at the end of this passage in verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and and great was the fall of it. Um, you know, last night we had a wild storm come out of nowhere. I mean, I was out feeding horses and I, I felt like one of my kids, and I, I really thought it was one of my kids, I was, and I immediately was so angry, like I'm gonna chunk this child. But I'm outside and I just got beamed in the back. I thought some kid threw a rock at me, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. They're going to, if it's Kai, he's not going to see six. He's, he dies tonight. Um, and I turn around, and it's just like, there's these golf ball-sized hail drops come flying out of the sky. And then it was like World War III out there because I had to grab a horse bucket, and I had to run for cover as I was just getting peppered by hail and all this stuff is happening and, and hail is falling in this wild storm and we got three inches of rain in about 40 minutes I mean just boom and I'm sitting there thinking about you know this weather and I, I'm a dad and it's my home and I'm thinking about damages and like okay because this is what dads do we've got these big windows that face north and lucky for us the hail was coming out of the north so it was perfect because um, it was just smack in our windows. And if those windows break, it's just like all of inside will be welcomed inside because they take up like an entire wall. So it's like beautiful. Um, and so I'm sitting on the couch and kids are kind of like freaking out a little bit. I'm like, it's good. It's going to go by fast. And I'm sitting there in my mind like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Uh, and I'm, I'm putting together a plan of, okay, what do I do when that window shatters? Like, how do I fix it? What do I put up against it? What do I do? What's the plan? And all that stuff. And this is what dads do. When stuff like that is brewing, we're just, we're, we're creating plans. Um, and as I'm sitting there, this, this passage comes to mind. And I start to just think about how grateful I am that I live in a, a well-built house. You know, a, a good house. I live in a good home. And some people, they, when a storm comes, they're terrified because they do not live in a safe place. And that storm's going to do some serious damage. It's going to come inside. They're going to have real issues throughout that entire, uh, that entire storm. And so I was thinking about how beautiful it is to have this wonderful house. And then I started to think about this passage in relation to today. And men, what, what we need to hear in this moment about this passage is that as you operate as the Lord commands, it is then that you are built upon a solid foundation. And so for us, to not treat, and we're going to dive in more into this, so I'm not going to get too far into it just yet, but for us to not treat others the way we would like to be treated is to remove our house from solid ground onto sand that will wash away when the, when the wind and the waves and the storm comes. 
It will not stand. You will be scrambling trying to keep your home together because you've built it upon a foundation that will never support your story, will never support your life because it is not meant to. So this is a commandment from the Lord that will allow us to build our life upon that which cannot be shaken, that which cannot move, and that which cannot be destroyed, no matter the circumstance. So I would also like to present this. How much of our life have we built upon that which is not stable? How much of our story have we built upon the sand instead of the rock? This is one of the things we need to do if we want our house to be built on solid ground. When we treat others how we would have them treat us, we are sowing seeds that enable all of this to happen, that enable us to be established on solid ground. It is an investment to be kind to others, to treat others the way you would like to be treated. And now I want to look at Psalm 13, uh, verse 1, and we're going to kind of jump around Psalms a little bit. Psalm 13, verse 1. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the, all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And then uh, Psalm 22, uh, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. And now 25, verse 16. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. And now I want everyone in this room to be honest right now. Who in here has ever felt alone? Like not kind of alone, I'm talking about completely alone, on your own, completely. And you look and you're like, there is, there is nowhere to go to not be alone. To feel that loneliness. And how many of you in that, in that loneliness, in that, in, in that loneliness, when does that come? That comes on really difficult days or a lot of difficult days that have built up. And then you just get to this moment where you're looking around and you are so overwhelmed by the circumstances and you feel so, lo so alone. And how many of us have just wished for someone to see us, to hear about what we're dealing with, or to just notice us and for them to step in and say, hey, are you okay? Are you doing all right? How many of us have been in those moments of loneliness and desperately longed for someone that we didn't have to ask because this is, this is a struggle for me. I know this is a struggle for men. We do not do well asking for help in our weakness. That is not where we shine especially if we're vulnerable, because that's what it is. Vulnerability in our society is weak. I've never seen a good, strong marriage be produced because of a lack of vulnerability. I've never seen kids raised up in the way that they should go because they were around a man who was never vulnerable. Because when they see us in our vulnerability and we're honest with it, it, it shows them, uh, it, it just reveals a lot of the nature of God to them. But how many of us, again, we, we have been in that moment and we've just wished for someone to notice that I'm hurting and just come. Just ask me if I'm okay. Just ask me how I'm doing. It's, it's, it's a difficult place to be. But just a wish for someone to come sit with you or leave you a voicemail or an encouraging text. Just something to let you know that you are not alone. And this is how men often feel. This is how husbands and fathers often feel. We long for someone to just tell us, hey, you're doing a good job with your kids. Hey, you're, you're a good man. You're, you're, you're a kind man. You're a good leader. Like we long to hear those things. 
We not we're and we're not seeking them out, but when men hear that, it 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 solidifies us in the place that we're meant to be. It it allows us to stand firm in where the Lord would have us stay because we are seeing somebody else has seen the fruit of our efforts. Because we're not doing this effort for anybody else to see or, or for us to be made into a big deal, but it is still beneficial, right? Like this is this is something I think uh, a lot of teachers can relate to. It's just nice for someone to come up to a teacher and say, hey, you're doing a really good job because teachers put in a ridiculous amount of work. And a lot of that work goes completely and totally unseen, right? My kids, they know I go to work every day. They don't see it every day because they don't go with me. And so it's nice in those moments when I'm gone and I'm dealing with stuff and I'm struggling and I'm working and I'm trying to earn a living and I'm trying to make a way and I'm trying to provide for them and they don't see it. They just know I'm out there, but it's really encouraging in those moments when people notice like, hey, you just need to know that you're doing a good job. Men love that. We appreciate, or we don't love it, we appreciate it. I don't say that we'll love it because we don't seek it out. We really don't like the attention, but we do appreciate those moments <laughs> where we feel seen when we feel seen and church in this season that we're in of this this theme of stepping in to what the Lord has for us what he's doing what he's equipping what he's building in this community and he's calling us to step into it this golden rule is going to be paramount not to just simply be nice We need to be nice, obviously. We need to be and display the kindness of God, but that's not the message for us today. This rule, the golden rule, is so important in the season and always because it is time for us to be there for others the way we wish someone would be there for us. It is time for us as men, it is time for women to be there for those that you in a way, to be there for others in a way that you wish someone would be there for you. You hear what I'm saying? Does that make sense? To be there for others the way you wish someone would be there for you. When it's inconvenient, when it's uncomfortable, when it's sad, and when we don't know what to say, we need to be there. When it's inconvenient, when it's uncomfortable, when it's sad. I mean, I don't know how many times I have talked myself out of calling someone or being there for someone because I just didn't have the words. I didn't know what to say to them in the midst of their pain. And so what would we do? We just, I'm just not going to be there. I don't want, I don't want to say something wrong. I don't want to inconvenience them. I don't want to say something inappropriate that might make it worse. And so we just, ah, I'm just, I'm just going to stay back here. I'll pray for them. Pray for them. And that's what we do. And we just remove ourselves from a position of help, a position of rescue. Because there have, there have been times in my life where I've not, I don't need anybody to say anything. I just need somebody to be next to me. And to just know that this person right here has my back, whatever I need in this moment, whatever I need, but I don't need them to say anything. And we have removed the value that the Lord has assigned to just being present. Words are not necessary to be present, but just being there is enough. Just being present is enough. I I have had more of these moments as a pastor than I ever thought. And I've I've not enjoyed a lot of that. I mean, in in my first three years, I I got to bury uh, two kids that grew up with me. And I I also buried two grandfathers. It's like, boom. But what I realized in those moments, because I don't know how to, what, what do you do to somebody who's losing a kid? What do you say? There's nothing you can say. But what I found out was just being near, 
was enough. That's it. That was all it was. And what I found in those families and in those moments and in, in my family was they didn't need the pastor to talk. They just needed to know that he was there. And that's all they wanted. That's it. Church, there's something so valuable and so beautiful about just being present in the midst of somebody else's difficulties. You don't have to come and fix it. Stop trying to fix it. That's why we remove ourselves from being vulnerable with others because we think we need to bring a solution to their struggle. You don't. Your presence is the solution because your presence will be encouraging and it will allow them to navigate the storm before them. You can't just avoid a storm because there's a storm and you don't want to deal with it. Last night, if I could have just said, uh, please stop hailing on my house and go, just, just don't do that. That's not how that works. You've got to weather it. And that's life. There is no avoiding storms. There's no avoiding hard days. But to know that you're not alone in them is the difference maker. Because it is fuel for you to navigate your story through that storm. To continue to move forward because you know you're not alone. If you have ever felt alone, I would like you again to just, just raise your hand. Just keep it up for a second, please. If you would not mind. If you've ever felt alone, just raise your hand. And now look around the church. And this was the question I was asking the Lord, or he was asking me, because he gave me this. He said, ask them to raise their hands and look around. And I knew, I knew what the result was going to be. I knew everyone was going to raise their hand. There's not going to be a single person that's like, no, I've, I've never felt alone in my entire life. Like, don't lie in the house of the Lord, right? Uh, don't do it. I knew everybody's hand was going to be raised. And the question the Lord asked me said, where were you? And then he said, where were we when that person felt alone? Where was the church when that person felt alone? Where were we? Church, I, I hope we hear this this morning, that you can't expect there to be people in places that you are unwilling to go. And you can't lead people to places that you will not go. If you won't venture into areas, you can't expect people to be there waiting for you. It's like waiting, expecting people to be in this building, but never willing to walk into the building yourself. You can't expect there to be anybody there waiting for you. And you also cannot lead anyone into a place that you are unwilling to venture into yourself. Can't do it. I cannot lead my sons into a place of honest communication and, and understanding how to navigate their emotions in a healthy way and navigate their situations in a healthy way and have strong, godly relationships with other men that will allow them to weather those storms. I can't expect them to do that if they never see me step into it. I'm the example that they will see on how to deal with conflict. I'm the example that they will see on how to deal with a difficult circumstance. I'm the example they will see on how to deal with heartbreak. We as men, we as fathers. And they will not go in a place that we cannot lead them or we're unwilling to lead them. We can lead them into it, but we have to be willing to lead ourselves to step into it first on our own. We need to just simply be there for others in their hard days. And you will find people, when we are there for others, you will find people waiting to help you through yours. And men, we need to stop putting on a front, pretending to be fine when we aren't. Because to be, to be brave, to be tough, is not to suppress and not to be quiet. It's to go to someone in the midst of struggle and tell them, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm hurting, I'm having a really hard day. But don't just open up about the bad days. This is another thing that we as men are really, really bad at. Because treat others the way you want to be treated. How many of you have had a wonderful thing happen, a wonderful day, and you still felt alone because you didn't have anybody to share it with? Yeah, I've had plenty of those too. 
How many of you have had a moment that you are so excited about that has happened and you want to celebrate it, but you are worried to share it with anybody else because you don't think they're going to think it's as great of a thing as you do? And you're worried that they're just going to be like, okay, cool. And then you're just going to be disappointed because like, well, maybe I over, maybe this isn't that big of a deal. So you don't want them to rain on your good day. So you just don't tell anybody about it. Right? We do this too. Men, talk about the good days, not just the bad. It's okay to celebrate your story. It's okay to celebrate what God is doing. It's okay to celebrate those moments those just wonderful and amazing moments that are just found in everyday life. It's an amazing thing to share with one another. We as men need to allow each other in. We, all of us in here, we don't want our sons to be closed off like we have been. But again, they will follow our example So we need to be honest and we need to just be present. We need to be present and be there for one another. We need to be there for others the way we wish someone would be there for us. Amen. Church, a brighter day is ahead of us as we connect as God intended. Now imagine a house, this house built upon a solid rock because you have a group of people that share life together. This is something that is desperately lacking in the church today. We don't have, we have people that attend church together. We don't have people that live life together. We're, we're, we have fun and we're friendly when we're here together, but Monday through Saturday is a mystery for all of us. Like, I don't know what you're going through because we're just not honest. We're just not honest. You can be joyful on a hard day too, right? You know that. You can be joyful on a hard day. And someone can come up to you, say, hey, how are you doing? Be like, you know what? I'm good. Like, God is good. But I'm dealing with some stuff. It's pretty hard. But God is still good. That's, that doesn't change. He's still good. And he, what does he do? He works all things for the good of those that love you. So you know that every difficult situation is only temporary because there's going to be good around the corner. So we can be good and we can be joyful on really bad days. And it's okay to say that I'm good. But today is, a, today is a rough one. It's like, okay, perfect. Let me be there for you in it. We just need to be honest, church. But I'm telling you, what, what a house. What, I mean, just the beauty of it, to have a group of people who are so connected because they're honest and vulnerable with one another. They don't put up any fronts. They don't put on a mask. They don't fake it. They just exist together in vulnerability and honesty in pursuit of Jesus. What does that house look like? What does worshiping in that place look like? What does community with that group of people look like? This is the kind of community we need to have in Sundown, Texas. This is the kind of community that the Lord teaches us about in this book that he said you were made for. You're made for fellowship. You're made for community. And it's also important, and and this is the the last thing, and I'll close, but in Acts 42 through 47, this is after the Spirit has been released, after Peter Peter has has preached his message, and 3,000 souls repented, were baptized, and received the Holy Spirit. And then verse 42, the birth of the church. It's right there. And it says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread. So the first the first example of the church we see, it's, it's and, and if you want to know what church is meant to look like, go back to its starting place. The spirit is received, the church is born, the body of Christ is realized, and they devote themselves to the pursuit of Jesus and to fellowship with one another. That should tell you how important it is 
to be there for each other, to treat others the way you would like to be treated. Be there for those around you the way you would hope one day they'll be there for you. Amen? It's a, it's a, we live in a wonderful, wonderful time. I know we talked about some of the difficult things about society, but at the same time, because of those things that they're, the, just the ridiculous arguments that are being thrown out there, because of that, people are starting to turn and really question for the first time what these roles are, what it is to be a man, what it is to be a father. And you're seeing an awakening of people. Well, we, we've, uh, Sarah and I have had uh, several conversations about this, but there has been such an awakening of people that have run and returned to Jesus. Because the more he's attacked, the more it's made to be a negative thing in society and on media and social media and all that stuff. The more they do that, and this is the, the ploy of the enemy, he's trying to get you, he's just screaming it as loud as he can in your face so that you would think, oh, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, I don't want anything to do with it. But what it's causing is for people to say, well, why is it bad? Why, is it, why, why do you hate Christians so much? What does this actually say? And then they start reading it for themselves. So much so that on national television, you had a girl getting ready to go up to bat in a softball uh, tournament game, and it, it was to send them to the World Series. And you see the camera turn, and her teammates are praying over her and anointing her head for the peace of God to flow. And whatever happens, that the peace of God would consume her. And then when the ESPN reporter asks about that moment, because that girl comes up and then she hits a home run, sends them to the World Series, it's, and she goes to talk about it. She's like, well, my teammates anointed me. They prayed over me and I felt the peace of the Lord. And I realized that it doesn't matter the result here. God is good. If I strike out, if I hit, whatever happens, God is good. She said that on national television. So much so that the reporter's like, okay, thanks. It's like, we got to back out because she just, she's preaching now. I got to get out of here. And they did it over and over and over and over and over and over again. You've got a coach right now for the Celtics in the finals. About to win the biggest trophy there is in basketball. And a reporter asking, you know, how cool is it that there's two black coaches in the, in the finals? You know, what, how, what's the impact of that? And he said, I wonder how many coaches that have come to the finals were believers of Jesus Christ. And the reporter's just like, Next question. Like, dang, I was baiting him, trying to get a, a hot take, and he just started talking about Jesus. And this dude does it stoic, stone cold, every single time. But what we are seeing is the more society tries to tear down that which is of God, the more society is building it back up. And man, it's time for us to build it back up. We are meant to be vulnerable in moments where vulnerability is necessary. We're meant to be honest with ourselves and with those around us. We are the example of this. We're the example our kids will follow. Be there for others the way you would hope someone would be there for you. Thanks for listening to this message. For more resources, visit sundownchurch.com.